or even the Brady Bunch. This, of course, has to do with the strict censorship of the time that, for instance, didn't allow Lucy to say she was pregnant. She was merely expecting, no doubt, the stork. Don Grady, who played Robbie in My Three Sons, was aware of the censorship pressures applied to a family show. Nowadays, as a full-time songwriter and composer, he's aware also of the cleverness of My Three Sons' insistent theme. Where did the theme come from? Frank Duvall wrote this theme um, and I mean he, he was beautiful what he did he just took you know your basic chopsticks and he just put I can see him sitting at the piano you know the line must be it's perfect because it's about boys and kids and then he did created a little piece of, you know, innocuous music that has lasted and sticks in your mind forever. Actually, Three Sons started out in 60. Uh, we came off the heels of shows like the Donna Reed show, Father Knows Best. We were novel in our day because we were kind of messy. We had, the dog was on the table, you know, eat, trying to eat the food. Uh, we came down to breakfast without our suits on. <laughs> You know, and this at the time was like real American life. And that was, I think, the, the initial success for Three Sons was that we were kind of sloppy and we were kind of real. Later on, as we got more women in the show and so forth, they kind of cleaned up our act and, you know, we became the clean show, uh, you know, neat and tidy and everything. Then later, much later, after Robbie got married, it was 67 and the first scene of Robbie and Katie's being together up in the Douglas household, because we were not allowed to move out of the house, otherwise you wouldn't have a series. Um, they had two beds for Katie and Rob. And when I got to the set, I said, well, now wait a minute. I mean, this is, a, you know, 67. And uh, I said, we can't have it. And well, they were very nervous about it. They didn't want to have us in one bed. I said, I'm not going to do this scene. This is ridiculous. I mean, I, I just no two kids you know sleep in separate beds anymore that's Ozzie and Harriet I mean if we're gonna have separate beds then at least show a well-worn pathway on the carpet or something so I had to do some research and I found out that Bewitched had a single bed they were the only series at that time that had a single bed with two you know married couples staying in it so I got a film clip from them brought it to uh, the Federson people who produced three sons and showed it to them and we got to sleep together. <laughs> uh, I, I think because uh, Gomez was um, a uh, romantic husband, uh, even, even though his family was supposed to be weird, uh, they were really very healthy family. And uh, the sexual relationship between Gomez and Morticia was something that was missing from television. There, you know, nobody did it, as it were, on television in those days, and, except for Gomez and Morticia. <laughs> and we, 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 uh, you know, sometimes did it in the living room. <laughs> but, and occasionally we get letters from people, uh, you know, who objected to this. But in general, uh, the fact that there was real affection between husband and wife, and generally among the family itself, you always supported the kids, and the kids uh, uh, were happy uh, kids, and uh, everybody liked everybody else and supported everyone else. Uh, that was something families really wanted to see, and still want to see. I think it's one of the, one of the keys to the show, is it's a really a, a good, solid, affectionate family relationship. The comedy was slapstick and also a lot of innuendo, and on different levels it appealed to everybody. There was something in there for everybody, and uh, people could identify with different characters in it, and it was just so off the wall they couldn't believe it. And uh, that will always last, I think. I don't think it'll ever go off the air. When I was 15, I went backstage to, at that time, it was Welcome, my, Welcome to My Nightmare, Alice Cooper's big tour. And this was here in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Forum. And I was backstage 
totally in awe that I was there. Now, of course, Alice Cooper had the same type of thing, the black makeup and whatever type of thing. And, and anyway, he, a friend of mine knew that he was a big Adams Family fan. And I was there, and, and just like I said, I couldn't believe I was there. And he tapped him on the shoulder. He said, hey, Alice, that was the little chick on the Adams Family. Well, I he couldn't believe it. He came over to me. He grabbed a hold of my hand. He said, oh, my God, it is such a privilege to meet you. And started quoting lines to me that I didn't remember. And I was just, I couldn't believe this. He called the press over. He said, do you know who this is? And just made, and I was like, I couldn't believe that here's this big, huge rock star making such a big deal over me. That's, uh, that's kind of nice to, you know, to feel that uh, some of the stuff you did is, you know, continuing on that way even if they don't pay us residuals. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up, a fabulous episode of The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, and we reunite all the team. It was a housebound sitcom that revolved around little kids. Dobie Gillis, on the other hand, was a teenage sitcom that got out of the house. To Dobie, his parents were an impediment that stood between him and fun. He wanted to be with his friends from school and college. Maynard, his beatnik good buddy. You rang? snobby Chatsworth, and of course that other impediment, Zelda. While Dobie longed for luscious dolls, Zelda longed for Dobie, and she was so determined she usually got her way with him. I love you, Dobie. Oh, please leave me alone, Zelda. My life is in ashes. Let me finish. I love you, Dobie. I love you so much I can't stand to see you suffer. These days, the Hollywood Hills are alive with the sound of remakes, and Dobie's no exception. Dwayne Hickman, who for many years after playing Dobie worked as a CBS executive, has produced the Dobie reunion telemovie. He got everyone back for it, the actors Bob Denver, Steve Franken, who played Chatsworth, and William Shallot, who played their teacher, Mr. Pomfret. He even convinced Sheila James, who played Zelda, to return. She had left the business to become a university law professor. And Zelda was a great character. Think about this woman. In 1959, when I'll bet every other woman on television was, first of all, she wasn't a woman, she was a girl, and was dumb or sort of subservient. I mean, the, the wife roles in the family, I mean, way before the women's movement. But Zelda was an energetic, directed, bossy person who knew exactly where she wanted to go and what she wanted in life. She was capable of anything if she decided she wanted Doby to be a record star. She started started a record company. You know, if she wanted to uh, him to win a drag race, she built a drag racer for him. It was an extraordinary role. And also, I like these people so much that just to do a reunion, it was like going back to uh, to a college reunion with your four best friends. Zelda, you're a real human being. I think it's that Doby is representative of kind of middle America. Do Doby's a kind of average guy. Uh, he's not real smart and he's not dumb. He's not real handsome and he's not real unattractive. He's just sort of, he's not rich and he's not real poor. You know, he's not kind of in the middle, he's middle America, Midwestern USA. And I think somehow I must represent that. I, you know, I guess, I guess I'm talking about myself. See, I've always been a straight man to Bob Denver, which I've always enjoyed. I don't mind it, it's fun. I mean, I, I, I enjoy Bob personally, he's a friend. We've never had a harsh word. Uh, I like working with him, and I don't mind because, you know, what do you mean, Maynard? I mean, Maynard, please. Never mind. You know, I mean, I, I don't mind saying that, what do you mean, Maynard, you know? Because that's the way, the setup. I'm, I'm the straight character. Uh, I think probably it helped Bob to be Maynard a lot because he went and did Gilligan's Island. All I know is that I'm the best friend you ever had. True? True. And how long have we been friends? Since we've been little tiny babies? Yeah, and who taught you how to crawl? You. And who taught you how to walk? You. But to tell you the truth, you didn't do such a good job. I walked pretty funny, though. <laughs> but you get around, don't you? <laughs> I loved comedy, so this character was perfect for me. It was wide open. In fact, in the fourth year, I got blasted off to the moon with a chimp. You know? And there was all kinds of really, you know, fantasy, you know, plots in the fourth year, and I loved it because Maynard then could do basically anything, you know? Um, Played cards with a chimp in the capsule. I love that. That chimp grabbed my hand and put it in his mouth, right? All four fingers like this. And I thought, you know, and the trainer's standing there, and he said, um, I said, hey, could you make him let go? And he said, I can't do anything. I look at him, he's white, and he's got little perspiration burst out here, and I went, he's not acting. 
And I said, well, you've got to make him let go. Meanwhile, the chimp is standing down there holding my four fingers right here in his mouth, not, just holding, not pressing yet. He says, you know, if he bites down, he, he, he'll take him off. I'm going, this, this, is the, this is a joke? And he's not, I can see it's not a joke. And I said, well, what am I supposed to Meanwhile, it's getting hotter and wetter. And, and he's just looking at me like this, you know, just looking up, see what I'm going to do. And the trainer says, I can't do anything. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? How do I get my hand out of his mouth? And he says, well, hit him with the heel of your hand right between his eyes as hard as you can. And he's whispering this to me like the chimp's going to hear him. And I said, sure. And he says, no, it's really, I mean, don't pull your punch. Your heads are like concrete, you know? And I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm still standing there. And now it's gotten very quiet all over the set. Everybody's standing looking, right? And I don't know what to do. I really didn't. And he's saying, do it, do it. So he says, don't let him see it coming. I'm going, this is, my four fingers are in there and I'm supposed to hit this guy. And I finally realized it was the only thing to do. There was no other suggestions being made and I'm still stuck. So I gave him a shot like that, you know? crossed his eyes, right? My hand came out real fast. And from that moment on, that chimp, I looked at him and go, yes, sir, where do you need me? Where do you, Mr. Denver, over here? Over here, where do you need me? And I said, whoa, that really worked out well, you know? All right, musicians, and I use the term loosely, <laughs> the William Tell Overture from 19, the Agitato. Pomfret served a purely, um, a purely uh, functional role in that. There was no character to him at all. Uh, when I did him originally, he was written, Max Schulman, he was sort of Max Schulman's mouthpiece, a sort of a comment on the young generation and how they're going to hell in a handbasket, <laughs> more or less. And he would, he was so discouraged with his class of, of uh, some of them real ninnies, like, like uh, or, or, you know, totally out of it, like, uh, like Bob Denver at Maynard, yeah. But uh, Pomfret used to say, my father used to tell me to go into air conditioning. <laughs> and he, he wondered why he was teaching. At one point, he actually left the high school to get away from them and went to work at a junior college, and they followed him <laughs> out of loyalty. He was so depressed by that. No, no, Fluke, what are you playing? Esme, dear. Oh, go away. I will not go away. Why do you think I joined this silly band? Why do you think I learned how to play this silly thing? For only one reason, Esme, only one. For you. Oh, no, not again. Yes, 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 again and again and again. As long as there's breath in this body. Esme, I love you. Well, look, that's ridiculous. Why? Why is it so ridiculous? You know very well why. No, I don't. Tell me. I won't tell you. I'll show you. <laughs> 